Jerusalem, the storied city of David, often destroyed, but always rebuilt. It has been celebrated in song as the mother of mankind. The prophet Ezekiel called it the center of the earth. In and around Jerusalem, across war-ravaged hills, arid desert expanses, lush, fertile valleys and open fields, along the riverbanks and lake shores of Palestine, God elected to make himself manifest in the person of his only begotten son. In Jerusalem, the Son of God, a humble man, sacrificed himself for the salvation of mankind. His modest life in Palestine and the pain of his passion in Jerusalem changed the course of civilization. Two thousand years later, the message of his ministry and his triumph over death is still felt around the globe. The church that Jesus Christ founded in this time-weathered land, the church that Peter and Paul and the other apostles took beyond the narrow boundaries of Palestine, still carries on today the essence of life that the Son of Man proclaimed in his ministry. A church, ecclesia, a calling together, a gathering, bringing people together to form a kinonia, a community surviving persecution, oppression, and even desertion, the church has stayed its course for 20 centuries to remain the faith of the New Testament, forever pronouncing its enduring message of love, agape. Built on the unshakable foundation of tradition, it still clings faithfully to fundamental Christian ethics, preaching the righteousness of God, eternal love, forgiveness and compassion, tolerance and understanding, philanthropia, God's love for humanity. A journey back in history is always an opportunity for reflection. Who we are, what we are, where we are today, depends on where we were yesterday. The uninterrupted chronicles of people and events, custom and worship, the dazzling splendor of colorful ritual and decorum, the radiant treasure of timeless art and architecture, the questioning by the minds of believers and the challenge from the minds of unbelievers, the constant dialectic of debate and decision, the evolution of dogma and doctrine, a vital, vibrant body of faith and beliefs presumed to be valid. All these elements form the individual links of a chain connecting us to our roots and to our heritage. Anchored in the scriptures, this long, unbroken chain of tradition is the brilliant legacy of Eastern Orthodox Christianity.
The kingdom of God may not know physical bounds, but Christianity cast its early tentative roots in the narrow deserts and valleys that extend along the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Palestine has appropriately come to be regarded as the cradle of religions. Christ was born just five miles south of Jerusalem in the village of Bethlehem. But he lived and practiced most of his ministry some 70 miles north of Jerusalem, around the Sea of Galilee, among Hellenized Jews and Gentiles. At Pentecost, 50 days after his glorious resurrection, Jesus, having already ascended to heaven, empowered his disciples with the Holy Spirit. That very day, 3,000 were baptized into the church, and the first Christian community was formed in Jerusalem. Go forth, Christ had commanded his apostles, and make all nations my disciples. First they went to the Jews, but then to Gentiles as well. And what began as a movement inside Palestinian Judaism was transformed within a few centuries into a universal religion. Christianity is forever marked by its Semitic origin, but it grew up in a decidedly Greek world. Jews, firmly in the grip of Roman rule, had long suffered under foreign influence and occupation, clinging to a sense of community, not as much in their political or cultural achievements as in the rich heritage of their religious life and tradition. This Old Testament Judaic heritage of fellowship, philanthropy, and belief in one God provided fertile ground for the message of Jesus. On the other hand, Rome had expanded its domain across the Mediterranean basin. Its military and commercial presence sustained three centuries of relative stability and peace. Pax Romana. The Romans contributed a framework of law and order, as well as freedom of travel and commercial trade routes the practical means by which ideas could spread. But it was the Greek language that served as the catalyst in propagating the Christian gospel. It was an advanced Hellenic culture and Greek classical thought that supplied the necessary climate for Christianity to actually take root and flourish. The sprawling conquests of Alexander the Great in the fourth century before Christ had spread Greek civilization to all corners of the known world. Greek had become the international language of the times, providing the means by which abstract ideas became universally intelligible. The rise of the Roman Empire did not change matters. Roman leaders spoke Greek as well as Latin, and the Roman Church celebrated its mass in Greek, not Latin, well into the third century AD. 
classical Greek philosophy had also gained a secure foothold in all territories of the Roman conquest. Immortality of the soul, as proposed by Socrates. Superiority of mind and reason over matter and the senses. Plato's concept that ideas or forms represented an eternal, unchanging reality behind ever-changing appearances. Aristotelian logic a systematic reasoning from a premise to inevitable conclusion. Ethics, a distinction between right and wrong, good and evil. The notion of duty and self-improvement promoted by the Stoics. All these ideas dominated the thinking of the era. In fact, Neoplatonic scholars, especially in Alexandria and Damascus, exerted tremendous influence on contemporary thought from the 3rd century BC well into the 4th and 5th centuries AD. Subscribing to the fundamentally Greek perception of logos, the word, or nous, mind and reason, as a supreme force, a moving spirit regulating the universe. With only a few exceptions, they were content to accept and promote the Christian concept of a divine spirit as an eternal power permeating the world. Christianity inherited a distinctly Jewish moral predisposition for philanthropy to feed the poor, care for the sick, and provide for the deprived. From Greek civilization, it took and radically altered Platonic ideals of immortality and perfection, Aristotelian logic, and the system of values developed by the Stoics, giving them new content and meanings. The fusion of the Gospel's message with the charity of Judaism and with the reason of classical Greece created the essence of humanity, which even today resides at the very core of Orthodox Christianity. Christian morality of love, compassion and sacrifice struck responsive hearts. Its message of salvation, promising life eternal after death, fell on receptive minds. And the inclusivity of this new religion, its intimacy and sense of belonging attracted alienated souls. The predominantly pagan populations in rural areas felt threatened by the Christian rejection of pagan gods whose favor they believed brought success to the empire. Loyal Roman citizens in urban centers resented Christian indifference for imperial or military service. Worse yet, government didn't take kindly to Christians renouncing the emperor's divinity. Their preaching of a new king suggested revolution, if not treason. In such an environment, hospitable to fundamental Christian beliefs, but hostile to their apparent consequences, Christianity took its first tentative steps to enlighten civilization and to transform and build cultures. St. Paul, a Greek-speaking Jew, with the distinct advantage of full Roman citizenship, in fact, once a zealous persecutor of Christianity, became its most passionate convert and missionary. He set out to attract the masses to what he called the body of Christ. In four consecutive journeys, strenuous enough to have broken a man of lesser faith, often at risk, St. Paul touched Jews and Gentiles alike. His ministry met with either acceptance or rejection, never indifference. At Philippi, he baptized Lydia, the first Christian convert on the European continent. Immediately thereafter, he was arrested, whipped, and imprisoned. Miraculously, he escaped.
At Arios Pagos, beneath the shadow of the Parthenon, he came to preach to the Athenians about their unknown God. Mocked and ridiculed by skeptical elders of a former power in decline, he remained undaunted. In the span of 13 years, St. Paul traveled almost 15,000 miles, by boat, but mostly on foot, establishing churches across the empire. The apostle of the Gentiles, he took Christianity out of the narrow confines of the Jewish synagogue and into the world. The church and its growth followed commercial and political centers across the dominions of Rome. The empire, after all, especially in its eastern part, had been an empire of cities. In the first generation of Christians, administrative authority rested in the hands of the apostles. However, once a church was established, an apostle, before moving on in his mission, would appoint elders to oversee the affairs of each community. By gradual evolution, there emerged an administrative structure with threefold ministries. Deacons, attendants to perform community services, presbyters or elders to assist in the administration of the community and its worship, episcopi, the overseers, or bishops to preside over the church in each city. By the second century, such a church hierarchy had been clearly established. Each city had an ordained bishop, an episcopos, tracing themselves to an apostle. To this day, countless episcopal seats in the Orthodox family claim such an unbroken tradition of apostolic succession. By a laying on of hands upon ordination of a bishop, authority passed directly from an apostle to the bishop and to each of his successors thereafter. The expansion of the church during these formative years was neither spontaneous nor trouble-free. Its seeds were nourished by the blood of martyrs. Martyrdom and persecution awaited at every single crossroad. Emperor Nero used Christians as living torches to illuminate his gardens at night. And sporadic waves of persecution erupted in practically every corner of the empire. Despite periods of tolerance, during its first three centuries, Christianity remained a religion expressly forbidden and oppressed by the government. There were even state-sanctioned outbursts of general persecution when worship of Christ was punished by death. The Great Persecution, launched by Emperor Diocletian at the turn of the 4th century, ordered destruction of all church buildings, confiscation of Christian books, dismissal of Christians from government or military positions, and imprisonment of all clergy. During such times, Christians had no place to go. They had to take their church underground to dark tunnels, the catacombs, where they usually buried their dead. These caves were the first churches, the first altars, the first schools that helped Christians sustain their faith and keep the flame alive.
Tradition has it that Emperor Constantine saw a vision of the cross of Christ with the inscription En tuto nika. In this you conquer. As he prepared for battle to consolidate his claim on the Roman throne in the year 312 AD, Constantine used the cross to rally his army and subsequently changed the course of Christendom and human civilization as well. Inspired by his vision, victorious in battle, Constantine became a protector of the Christian faith. He came to be known as Constantine the Great, and with his mother Helen was recognized by Orthodox Christianity as one of its greatest saints and benefactors. The Edict of Milan, a decree issued soon after Constantine emerged as the sole emperor, put an end to Emperor Diocletian's great persecution, granting Christians full freedom to worship. It transformed Christianity from the Church of the Catacombs to the Church of the Empire. Religion had long been integrated into Roman society. After all, like all other states of the era, the Roman Empire was based on religion. Constantine, in pursuit of the elusive Roman ideal for one state, one society, one ideology, saw in the communion of Christianity an opportunity to unify his empire. He imagined a single, powerful realm, imitating on earth the kingdom of heaven. In the year 324 AD, recognizing that Rome was too far immersed in pagan worship and idolatry, Constantine moved his imperial capital east to Byzantium, a small Greek colony on the shores of the Bosporus Strait at the fringes of Europe, overlooking Asia. The New Rome, he called it. Later, in his honor, it was renamed Constantinople, the city of Constantine. His dream gave birth to a Christian realm that provided the means for the ultimate integration of Christianity and Hellenism. Constantine himself was baptized only on his deathbed, but he had always regarded Christianity as the empire's privileged religion. Much later, in the fourth century, 50 years after his death, Constantine's favorable policies toward the church were finally carried through to completion. By decree of Emperor Theodosius the Great in the East and Emperor Gratian in the West, pagan worship was outlawed and Christianity was established as the state religion of the Roman Empire. Together, hand in hand, church and state prospered to become the glory that was the Christian Byzantine Empire. Constantinople, the cradle of Byzantine power and culture, flourished to become perhaps the most civilized city in the history of Christianity. It blended Hellenistic and Christian elements with a refinement that eloquently expressed itself in philosophy, theology, society, the law, government, scholarship, and the art. The 
Byzantine integration of Hellenism and Christianity, church and state, gave rise to the longest lasting dynasty in the history of mankind. For an unprecedented 1,000 years, Byzantine civilization dominated the history of the world, its impact still being felt today. The followers of Jesus Christ spread his word throughout the Mediterranean basin and the Christian faith flourished despite eras of violent persecution by the state. With the turn of the third century, Constantine the Great legitimized the Christian religion and found support in it to consolidate his claim as sole emperor of the Roman realm. Along the way, the Christian church had developed into a group of local congregations which tended to their matters internally and turned to higher authority the apostles and their successors in times of problems and doubts. By the middle of the third century, following the early example of the apostles, bishops of a province had occasionally gathered at provincial capitals to discuss and resolve common problems. As a result, the bishops of these capitals assumed certain added administrative duties and were given the honorary title metropolitan. Gradually, local councils of bishops expanded in scope to include bishops from other provinces. These larger councils usually assembled in the more prominent cities, Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. Consequently, their bishops acquired added prestige and importance in the affairs of the church beyond their own immediate provinces and were recognized as archbishops. Eventually, they became known as patriarchs, leaders of a patria, a family, a tribe. With the Byzantine integration of church and state, differences of opinion, which led to religious controversy and dispute, extended beyond provincial boundaries to assume a global significance. They demanded even broader ecumenical solutions. Emperors, eager to see controversies resolved for the sake of imperial unity, summoned bishops from every corner of the empire to seven successive ecumenical councils. 
The bishops attending these councils were admittedly imperfect men, but they are believed to have met and deliberated in the actual presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the decrees of ecumenical councils, convened and presided over by an emperor, were enacted into law, binding on the church as well as the state. By consensus of the collective body of bishops, the seven ecumenical councils either clarified Christian dogma, matters of faith and belief, or issued canons on administrative matters, defining the visible organizational structure of the church. The first two ecumenical councils were co convened during the fourth century to address issues arising from the so-called Arian controversy. The teachings of Arius, a priest from Alexandria who denied the true divinity of Christ. Both councils dealt primarily with the nature of the Holy Trinity. They clearly defined the divinity of Christ and the Holy Spirit in coexistence with the Father as one God, three persons in one essence. The first council was summoned to Nicaea in Asia Minor by Emperor Constantine the Great in the year 325 AD, condemning Arian theology. The bishops, as stewards of the whole church, articulated the Nicene Creed to reflect Orthodox faith. Uh, orthodoxa, by definition, the correct belief and the proper glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the right worship in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Catholic meaning general, universal, apostolic referring to the unbroken chain of succession from the apostles themselves. To this day, the Nicene Creed is still used by Eastern Orthodox Christians around the world. Despite the decrees of Nicaea, the Arian controversy did resurface often encouraged by Constantine's immediate successors. The Second Ecumenical Council, convened in Constantinople in 381 by Emperor Theodosius, after he had recognized Christianity as a state religion, reaffirmed the Nicene Creed to put the Arian heresy to rest once and for all. The next four councils addressed issues about the identity of Christ. They defined, accepted, and affirmed the person of Christ as the bridge between man and God, one substance existing in two natures, human as well as divine. He is fully human. He is fully divine. As a result, the Virgin Mary was affirmed to be the Theotokos, the mother of God. The language used at Chalcidon by the Fourth Ecumenical Council to define the dual nature of Christ caused the first serious schism of the Church. Monophysites, so-called because they were thought by critics to reject the dual nature of Christ, in fact objected not so much to the concept of duality, but rather to the expression of it. Further aggravated by imperial authority, as well as bitterness caused by national and cultural differences, they distanced themselves from the imperial church in the 5th and 6th centuries. The Coptic Church of Egypt, along with the Armenian Apostolic, Syrian Jacobite, and Ethiopian churches, collectively known as the Oriental Orthodox Churches, were separated from the main body of Orthodox Christianity. The seventh and last council, recognized by orthodoxy as ecumenical, addressed an often violent dispute that had raged for more than half a century over the use of icons in liturgical life. For orthodox Christians, icons, or holy images of persons and events, are an integral part of an act of prayer, not as objects of worship, but as representations for veneration. They serve only as reminders to instruct and assist the faithful. They translate the mystery depicted into a vibrant, meaningful, present reality. 
The iconoclastic movement launched by Emperor Leo II had compared icons to idols, condemning their use in worship and advocating instead only symbols like the cross. Iconoclasts had systematically destroyed or removed icons from all churches and public places and had vigorously persecuted advocates of icons. The Seventh Ecumenical Council, supported by the Empress Irene, soundly condemned the iconoclastic movement and validated the display of icons in all churches and everywhere else across the empire as windows to heaven. Nonetheless, the debate flared up again in the ninth century with a revival of iconoclasm. Finally, the Empress Theodora permanently brought the issue to an end by invoking the ecumenical decision of the Seventh Council and enforcing it as if it were state law. The settlement of the iconoclastic controversy, in addition to its religious significance, was a decisive victory for the artistic heritage of humanity. Orthodox churches everywhere today still celebrate the first Sunday of Lent as the triumph of orthodoxy, to commemorate the final victory for icons and their undisputed restoration to the church. All factions of Christianity continued to make decisions on matters of faith as well as administration long after the Seventh Council. However, the basis of Christian faith and order was formulated by the ecumenical councils of the Imperial Church. As such, they represent a significant part of the common heritage shared by all Christendom, East and West alike. Under the protective auspices of the Emperor and with the singular contribution of stellar theologians, the seven councils interpreted and clarified the fundamental dogma and doctrine, which, along with the scriptures, form the cornerstone of orthodox belief. What helped to make all this possible was the close integration that existed in Byzantium between church and state. The two of them interdependent, but neither subordinated to the other. The emperor was understood to be no merely earthly ruler, but God's representative. This meant that he had responsibilities in the religious sphere. There were certainly times when the emperors exceeded their authority, when they tried to interfere directly in matters of doctrine. On such occasions, the church leaders and the monks made it clear that the church had a mind and will of its own. From the moment the church was born, there were always people who bore witness that the kingdom of God is not a kingdom of this earth. They served as a constant reminder that Byzantium was a mere symbol of the kingdom of heaven, not itself the reality. Some of them rose to prominence as the great defenders of orthodoxy. These men of extraordinary holiness are collectively known as the great fathers of the church. Countless others, perhaps less known but no less saintly, made their presence eternally felt by word, deed, or sacrifice. Almost all of them were nurtured and sustained by the monastic movement to become the enduring conscience of the earthly church. Monasticism as a fully developed institution did not exist before the fourth century. It grew gradually as a retreat from Christian complacency and ethical decadence brought about by the legalization of the faith. To a lesser extent, it was also a reaction against excessive imperial interference in the internal affairs of the church. Monastic settlements blossomed in the deserts of Egypt, Syria, and Palestine, and later in the rocky formations of Cappadocia in Asia Minor, and much later at Metera in central Greece. But since the 10th century, the center of Monastic life has been a rocky peninsula in northern Greece, Mount Athos, the holy mountain. In an age where blood martyrdom was preempted by legalization of the faith, monks and nuns, ascetics and hermits became the martyrs, subjecting themselves 
to self-denial, absolute obedience, and total seclusion. For the church in Constantinople, the middle of the 9th century was the start of intensive missionary activity. Restricted by the Oriental Orthodox churches and the rise of Islam to the east, and by increasingly strained relations with the Roman Latin church to the west, Patriarch Photius the Great dispatched two Greeks to the north to convert the Slavic peoples. Cyril and Methodius, brothers from Thessaloniki, took Christianity outside the comfortable boundaries of the Byzantine Empire and into an alien environment. Cyril and Methodius were determined to establish a native ministry. They developed a special alphabet from the Greek to translate the gospel and write service books in Slavonic. The written culture of the Slavs was born, allowing Slavic civilization to prosper. The Slavs were Christianized and civilized at the same time. They were given a fully articulated Christian doctrine in their own language and a fully developed Christian civilization. As a result, churches in Bulgaria, Serbia, and eventually in Romania and Russia thrived within natural national boundaries. For instance, in 927, less than a full century since Slavs first heard the gospel, the Bulgarian Orthodox Church was recognized by Constantinople as an independent autocephalous patriarchate. In 988, Russia officially became a Christian state with the conversion of Vladimir, ruler of Kiev. By that time, all the powerful states surrounding Kiev had abandoned paganism and adopted some form of monotheism. Vladimir wanted to do the same, so he sent envoys abroad to observe the rituals of Islam, Roman Catholicism, and Orthodoxy. The envoys were overwhelmed by the beauty of the Greek Orthodox rites they witnessed in the church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. When they returned to Kiev and gave their report, Vladimir decided to adopt the Byzantine form of Christianity and decreed that all his subjects be baptized in that faith. Few people have accepted the Orthodox faith with as much devotion as the Slavs. Their conversion was a pivotal event in their social growth and cultural progress. With the turn of the 5th century, a succession of developments triggered the total collapse of political unity in the Mediterranean world. First, the empire was once more divided, this time permanently, into separate realms. The Byzantine East centered in Constantinople, the Latin West in Rome, each with its own emperor. Soon after, barbarians, wave after wave of Germanic tribes, Goths, Vandals and Franks, invaded from the north to carve up the once proud western half of the Roman Empire into so many separate feudal kingdoms. The last remnants of political solidarity between Greek-speaking East and Latin West were destroyed never to be restored. During the reign of Justinian in the 6th century, while the West was still divided and in a constant state of conflict, the Byzantine Empire was rising to the height of its glory. Constantinople gained both prominence and influence. Justinian's gift to the world, the Church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, is perhaps the ultimate expression of Byzantine Symphonia a unique harmony between church and state. On the one hand, an imperial church attending to matters divine, guarding the state. On the other hand, a Christian empire presiding over mortals as protector of the church to preserve the faith. In such an environment, the Bishop of Constantinople, by tradition direct successor of Andrew, the first apostle of Christ and founder of the Church of Byzantium, assumed the title of Ecumenical Patriarch. He came to be recognized as spokesman and spiritual leader for Eastern Orthodoxy. Rome, based on Ecumenical Canon, objected, but to no avail. Political power and prestige had decisively shifted to the East. In the East, 
bishops of many local churches legitimately claimed a direct, unbroken apostolic succession. No less than four of them had been elevated by ecumenical council decree to prominent honorary status. Consequently, Eastern Orthodoxy evolved as a decentralized affiliation of co-equal bishops, subscribing to decision by consensus under the protection of a single strong secular head, the Emperor of Byzantium. On the other hand, in the West, in an unstable political environment, Rome alone could claim an apostolic foundation. As a result, the Ecclesia or Church of Rome developed a centralized structure. Slowly, religious as well as secular authority was concentrated in the office of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. Linguistic obstacles compounded the problem, making communication even more complex and difficult. By the 7th century, very few in the West could read Greek, and although Byzantium still called itself the Roman Empire, it was a rare Byzantine who knew Latin, the language of the Romans. With the advent of Islam in the 7th and 8th centuries, the Mediterranean fell under Arab control, and cultural and commercial contacts between Rome and the prominent seats of Eastern Patriarchates started to deteriorate. Cut off from Byzantium and the Eastern Mediterranean, the West proceeded to establish a new Holy Roman Empire of its own, independent and emancipated from the Byzantines. To that effect, at the onset of the 9th century, the Pope crowned a new emperor, Charlemagne. Supported by a succession of popes, Charlemagne, former king of the Franks, attacked the legitimacy of the Eastern Empire in an attempt to take sole control of the Christian world and thus restore the empire in the West. The stage was set for an open conflict. The pretext for the confrontation, known as the Fortian Schism, was the encounter of Orthodox and German missionaries among the Slavs but its roots ran far deeper. The fundamental difference between East and West lay in assorted matters of ecumenical dogma and canon. Two key issues in particular. The first issue was the Roman understanding of papal primacy in the affairs of the church. Rome openly asserted its claims of jurisdictional supremacy in the middle of the ninth century. Pope Nicholas I tried to intervene in the internal affairs of the Byzantine church by ordering the deposition of Patriarch Photios the Great and the restoration of Patriarch Ignatius to the throne of Constantinople. At about the same time, the convergence of missionary activity among the Slavs in the plains of Eastern Europe brought to the surface the second issue, a long dormant controversy over the filioque. The Nicene Creed had clearly defined the Holy Spirit as the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. But the Latin West unilaterally added a phrase to read who proceeds from the Father and from the Son in Latin filioque, disturbing the balance of the Holy Trinity as defined by the first two ecumenical councils. St. Photius the Great a widely acclaimed scholar, regarded as one of the towering figures of orthodoxy, was eventually restored to the Patriarchate. Although Photius had played a key role in the growth of tension between East and West, during his second term of office he entered into a reconciliation with Rome. It was at best, however, a fragile peace. In less than a hundred years, following minor incidental conflicts, Cardinal Humbert a high-ranking representative from Rome placed a stamp of excommunication on the altar of Hagia Sophia at Constantinople, prompting the Orthodox Church to respond with anathemas of its own. This action marks what is commonly accepted as the beginning of the Great Schism. It was the year 1054 AD. However, some level of friendly relations was in fact maintained, as men of good conscience on both sides continued to hope that the gap separating them could be bridged. History proved differently. Of all things, the Crusades, 
organized and launched by the Holy Roman Empire to liberate the regions of the Eastern Christian Empire from the occupation of the Arabs, ultimately sealed the schism. On their fourth campaign, the year 1204, the Crusaders sacked Constantinople. They destroyed churches. They desecrated altars. They pillaged holy relics. The Crusaders, as Sir Stephen Runciman, the historian, has said, brought not peace but a sword, and that sword was to sever Christendom. The East Orthodox world has never forgotten the appalling sack of Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade. This meant that the long-standing doctrinal disagreements were now reinforced by an intense national hatred, by resentment of what was felt to be Western aggression and Western sacrilege. The Crusaders deposed the ecumenical patriarch and installed in his place Latin leadership. For half a century, Eastern Orthodoxy languished under Latin occupation, the Latinocratia. Devastated by the impact, Byzantines complained that even roving bands of uncivilized Arabs, the Saracens, are merciful and kind compared to these men who bear the cross of Christ on their shoulders. The Byzantine Empire never really recovered from the fall of 1204, although it survived for another two and a half centuries, agonizing at the sight of losing ground to the Ottoman menace. In 1439, at the Council of Florence, in an attempt to end the schism that had torn East and West apart, both Eastern Orthodoxy and Byzantium capitulated to Roman supremacy. Both agreed to a union with the Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Empire in exchange for military support to defend against the threat of advancing Ottoman Turks. The so-called Union of Florence, however, was short-lived. In response to swift, loud public outcry, it was immediately repudiated. On the 7th of April, 1453, the Ottomans, spurred by the dreams of Mohammed the Conqueror, launched a massive attack on Constantinople by land and by sea. Hopelessly outnumbered, the Byzantines mount a valiant but futile defense, and during a relentless siege of bombardment and wave after wave of assault, still the city holds for seven long weeks. Before daybreak on May 29, Christian services are held in the Church of Hagia Sophia for the last time. Ironically, on that tragic moment, Orthodox and Roman Catholics, setting their differences aside, gather to pray together united. Emperor Constantine Paleologos, 80th successor to Constantine the Great, rejects pleas to flee. Instead, he falls fighting by the side of his men on the ramparts of the once mighty walls. The Sultan Mehmet is said to have shed tears of compassion at the sight of plunder and destruction that he and his men had wrought. Church bells fall silent, not to toll again for another four centuries. Hagia Sophia the most renowned symbol of Orthodox Christianity is converted to a Muslim mosque. Before long, the Muslim criers chant reverberates from minarets all across the Orthodox world. In a matter of few years, the glorious Byzantine Empire was no more, and with it, the Orthodox Church outside Russia entered an era of oppression and persecution.
The fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in the year 1453 might have signaled the end of the Byzantine Empire. By no means, however, did it mark the end of the Patriarchate of Constantinople or the end of Eastern Orthodoxy. Islam drew no distinction between religion and politics. Christians in the Ottoman Empire, regardless of their ethnic origin, were classified as the Rum Milet, the Roman nation, and their church served as a form of local government. The Orthodox Church became a civil as well as a religious institution. Bishops became government officials. The Patriarch, in addition to being the spiritual leader of the church, became the leader of a nation, the Ethnarchis. As a result, by grace of its conquerors, the Ecumenical Patriarchate played a decisive role in the survival of Orthodoxy and the Greek nation. Islamic law did not manifestly outlaw Christianity. As long as Christians submitted quietly to the supremacy of Islam, they were free to practice their faith without interference. Practical reality was a different matter altogether. Despite outward manifestations of tolerance, the Ottoman conquest plunged orthodoxy into darkness. The church and its officials fell prey to the greed, ambition and corruption of politics. Everything was for sale. The ecumenical throne itself was available to the highest bidder and the longevity of patriarchs depended on the prevailing whims of a ruling sultan. From the pinnacle of the Byzantine Empire, Christians were relegated to second-class status, their church a second-class religion. Islamic law prohibited the building of new churches and the ringing of bells. Compounding its alienation from the West, the entire Orthodox communion of the Balkans and the Near East languished in isolation, confined in a culturally and religiously alien Islamic world. Russia alone escaped that fate to aspire for leadership in Eastern Orthodoxy, precisely as its vast empire was beginning to take root. Ivan III, the Great, married a niece of the last Byzantine Emperor to establish a link with Byzantium. He assumed the titles Emperor and Tsar, a Slavonic equivalent to the Roman Caesar, and adopted the double-headed eagle of Byzantium as his state emblem. The Russians presumed to be the successors to the Byzantines. The first Rome, they reasoned, had fallen to barbarians because of heresy. The second to the Turks because of sin for accepting the unholy union with the Catholic Church, the short-lived Union of Florence. Moscow was still standing, the third and last Rome the center of Orthodox Christianity. There would be no other Rome, they said. Ivan IV the Terrible, assuming the role of champion and protector for all Orthodoxy, established his 16th century reign on that foundation and built an empire on it. With the approval of all Eastern Patriarchates, the Russian Church was recognized as autocephalous independent of any external church authority. The Bishop of Moscow was elevated to Patriarch. In the meantime, all the other Eastern Patriarchates remained isolated from the mainstream of European political and religious developments. Constantinople could not agree to overtures from the Protestant Reformation movement that shook the Western establishment in the 16th century. Neither was it in a position to stem the intrusion of Roman Catholic Jesuits and Protestant missionaries on Orthodox territories outside the Ottoman Empire. As a result, at the Union of Brest-Litovsk, an agreement concluded in the late 16th century, millions of Orthodox Christians in Ukraine, although allowed to retain their Eastern rites and customs, submitted to the doctrine of Rome and the jurisdiction of its Pope. The Ukrainian and other Eastern churches, which in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries entered into union with the Roman Catholic Church, have come to be collectively referred to 
as the Uniate or Eastern Catholic Churches. The recrimination and occasional violence that sometimes erupts between Uniates and Orthodox even today remains one of the sensitive areas of disagreement between the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic Churches. Greeks, on the other hand, suffered a different fate. Under the demoralizing effect of unrelenting social pressure, it became all but impossible for them to separate church from nation. More than ever before, Hellenism and Orthodoxy became inseparably intertwined. Secretly, the church sustained and nurtured the flickering candles of Greek culture, customs and traditions. If it weren't for the church, Greece would have lost all sense of national identity and unity. It was the church that stoked the flames of liberty. It was the church that inspired a demoralized, subservient nation to strike the banner that launched its revolution in 1821. Orthodoxy did not emerge from its long siege under the Ottomans without its share of martyrs. Eleven patriarchs and one hundred bishops among them. Cyril Lucaris, who served seven times as Patriarch of Alexandria and Constantinople, was drowned. Saint Cosmas Etolos, a monk who had become the most prolific missionary in Greece, also suffered a martyr's death. The ecumenical patriarch Gregorius V, along with two metropolitans and twelve bishops, was hung at the gates of the Patriarchate in retaliation for the outbreak of the Greek Revolution. Nevertheless, Ottoman rule did not erase the Orthodox faith. After the Greek uprising and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, riding the wave of 19th century militant nationalism, the church emerged safe and sound but with its structure permanently altered. The churches of Greece, Serbia, Romania and Bulgaria could not continue to function ecclesiastically under the jurisdiction of the Patriarchate that remained isolated in the foreign and hostile environment of the Ottoman Empire. By the end of the century they had established national, self-governing, independent churches. The ancient patriarchates of the Middle East, their strength tested by the long struggle to survive under Islam, found themselves outside the boundaries of modern Turkey. They are still surrounded by predominantly non-Christian populations, but have re-established their absolute independence from external church influence. Alexandria has extended its jurisdiction beyond Egypt and North Africa, south throughout the African continent with especially vibrant missionary activity in East Africa. The presence of Christianity in Africa will continue, and that means that the Patriarchate of Alexandria will survive. Africa is a continent with many Muslims, especially north of the equator. But it also has Christian Africans from the equator and below. Africa's Christianity and Africa's Islam meet, and they have a duty to find a way of life, both just and peaceful. And in this way of life, the Orthodox Patriarchate of the Orient, which has sowed its seeds in Uganda and Kenya, where we have a hundred thousand Orthodox Africans, will survive too. And who knows? Perhaps tomorrow, in the march of time, we shall have in the Patriarchate of Alexandria an African Patriarch. 
The Patriarchate of Antioch, now based in Damascus, the Syrian capital, continues to serve the Arab Christian population in Lebanon and Syria, with Arab patriarchs and bishops since the turn of the century. Islam is a very, very important phenomenon, and one has to face it. Not in a negative way. A Christian cannot be negative in any of the situations. He has to face things, and he has to be courageous enough to speak his faith. I don't believe very much in controversies, but I believe in exchange of human existence, of human feelings, of human collaborations. Because after all, not everyone in life knows every single yota of all dogmas. Religions are not dogmas. Religions are life, and if you meet people on the level of life, then you truly meet them and, and better understand them. Jerusalem, the Church of St. James, the brother of Christ, still ministers to a small, primarily Arab flock in Palestine, but provides invaluable service as the guardian and protector of Orthodox shrines in the Holy Land. The Patriarchate has struggled for many centuries here in the Holy Land and in the Middle East in general to protect our sacred national heritage and to preserve what our forefathers created. The Greek presence here dates to 232 before Christ. We came not as conquerors, nor to destroy and then leave. We came as reformers. That is why what our ancestors created today adorn the Middle East, and especially the Holy City. New excavations provide new evidence on the presence and work of the Greeks here. Our church undertook the leadership of our people after the Arab conquest of the Holy Lands. And since then, she strives to prove herself worthy of our nation, worthy of this great gift from God, who entrusted in the hands of Greeks the protection and service of the holiest pilgrimages of humanity. Constantinople, although stripped of most of its former territories and deprived of its flock by harsh political realities, still retains its position of primacy among Orthodox Episcopates. In such a shrinking world, East and West have lost their meaning, and the ecumenical patriarch is called upon to provide more than just spiritual leadership, emerging as an increasingly visible spokesman for worldwide orthodoxy. As the first general secretary of the World Council of Churches stated once, the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople was the first church in the world to call the churches for cooperation by issuing the famous encyclical of 1920. In this encyclical, the Patriarchate was saying that uh, the churches could, for, for one moment, forget their theological differences and come together to cooperate in the practical field by creating a League of, Nation, uh, League of Churches following the example of the League of Nations, which was created here in Geneva. That initiative eventually gave birth to a worldwide ecumenical movement seeking the cooperation and ultimate unification of all Christendom in a single, inseparable communion.
in the first ever direct personal exchange between Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox leaders since the 15th century, Pope Paul VI and Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras, according to the Pope, a great protagonist in the reconciliation of all Christians, met in 1964. The following year, their mutual excommunications were officially lifted and the two churches entered into dialogue. The dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church being the most important as well as the most difficult of the bilateral theological dialogues, unfortunately, during the past five years, is beset with great difficulty because of the dangerous revival of the immense problem of uniatism, particularly after the collapse of the communist regime of the former Soviet Union. If the authorities of the Vatican do not change their tactics on this problem, the dialogue between the two churches will continue to be restricted to one single topic, namely that of uniatism and proselytism. The fact that this year the meeting which had been scheduled could not take place due to the unwillingness of the majority of the Orthodox churches to attend the dialogue is indicative of the existing unfavorable atmosphere. The near future will provide the Orthodox Church with the opportunity to come closer to Islam and enhance the dialogue and mutual understanding between Christians and Muslims. The Orthodox Church will play a very important role in the future of the relationships between Christianity and Islam. So I am optimistic that in the next 20, 30 years, 50 years, or just now, the next 30 years, we shall have a very constructive dialogue which will be for the benefit of both sides. Because, because as you know, Islam and Christianity has many similarities, have many similarities. And we have, it is a necessity for us and for them, and the ethos of Islam, the countries, these people, particularly in the Middle East, is very close to the Orthodox. At the threshold of the third millennium, communion with other Christian denominations and dialogue with world faiths are only few of the challenges facing Orthodox Christianity. The unity and communication within the boundaries of the local Orthodox churches and the definition of an Orthodox identity in Western society are of primary concern. As countless immigrants fled poverty, war and persecution from their Eastern European homelands, Orthodox communities flourished outside their traditional environment in Western Europe the Americas, Australia, and the Orient. Scattered across the world, Orthodox Christians organize their communities along purely ethnic lines to create a variety of national churches with overlapping, often conflicting parish boundaries. Their need for unity and cohesion is pressing and immediate. Here, our first and pressing problem is to have a stronger visible unity. I would hope for the development of local Orthodox churches in the United States, Australia, Britain, other countries where there are large numbers of Orthodox. I would hope before too long we shall have in each place a single jurisdiction, a single episcopate, a local church with a synod of bishops able to make decisions for their own flock locally. Even the giant in the east emerged from its 70-year ordeal in the wasteland of militant atheism to face a new set of challenges. It is hardly possible to fathom the suffering and humiliation that Orthodox people endured in the 20th century under the systematic persecution of communist regimes. Churches were methodically desecrated,
closed and destroyed. In Russia, at one point, as many as 150 bishops were in prison. The number of martyrs is likely to exceed those who perished in the age of the catacombs and the Ottoman conquest combined. Persecution had crushed the church, but paradoxically also protected it. Its tradition, undiluted by secular realities, was passed on intact in the home, with even greater zeal by successive generations of devout grandmothers. However, having survived the grave challenges of tyranny, the reborn churches of Russia and Eastern Europe are now poised to share with worldwide orthodoxy the challenge posed by the demands of contemporary society. In the past centuries, Orthodoxy succeeded in integrating faith and worship with the everyday life of the people. Religion came into every aspect of life and interpersonal relations. Following the Industrial Revolution and the growth of big urban centers, this immediate and unambiguous blending of religion and society started to weaken, and religion became only a part of people's concerns. This is a concern very evident in Orthodox communities in Western societies. But it may become increasingly more important in every traditional Orthodox country of the East. Orthodox history is punctuated by a series of traumatic experiences. The conquest of Alexandria, Antioch and Jerusalem by Arab Muslims. The burning of Kiev by Mongol invaders, the sack of Constantinople by Crusaders and Ottomans, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and the ensuing dislocation by communism, the expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Greek Orthodox from Asia Minor. From Saint Stephen, the first martyr, and the apostles Peter and Paul, through the ages to the present moment, Orthodoxy has been forged on the anvil of persecution and sacrifice. It is small wonder that many may have deserted the church in the hour of trial and tribulation, but greater wonder still that so many have remained faithful to assure the survival of Orthodoxy as a community and as a vital component of contemporary society. Its essence remains the spiritual life, the mystical experience, time-tested truth, all incorporated in 20 centuries of paradoxes or tradition. The Gospels, the mission of the Apostles and their successors, the teaching of the Great Fathers, dogma and canons as promulgated by the Ecumenical Councils, the mystery of the Eucharistic liturgy and the experience of sacramental life. Universal in character, Orthodox Christianity is no longer confined to the eastern part of the world. Today, it is an unlimited global resource, a vibrant, brilliant mosaic of people who differ from one another not in worship or dogma, but in culture, customs, and language alone. From New York and Helsinki to Buenos Aires and Nairobi. From London to Kiev. Tokyo to Jerusalem. It seems to me that in the past, orthodoxy tended to be an instinct. People were orthodox because of their birth because of their national identity. In the future, orthodoxy is going to be a matter of personal commitment increasingly. Only those people will be orthodox who have actually chosen to be so. Their faith will need to be far more conscious. We should have to give far more attention to the need for people to make an actual step of commitment to their faith instead of accepting it passively. We shall need to understand much better what our orthodoxy is. It remains for so many of us a hidden treasure still.
The universal appeal of Christian orthodoxy lies in the heart of its humanity. Philanthropia, God's loving kindness toward mankind. Open, graceful, compassionate, and forgiving. Orthodoxy means living not in the anguish of mankind, but in the glory of God. It celebrates not Christ the victim, but Christ the victor. It emphasizes not so much satisfaction as much as salvation of humanity. Our relationship with God is not legal, it is spiritual. Each of us, man, woman, and child, forever remains a creature of God. Plasma foam. As such, all of us indeed carry within us a hidden treasure.